members, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I w- <laughs> I'm doing fine. <laughs> you are doing fine. You're doing great. I'm doing... No, that's not what I... I'm doing all right. I think that's what I usually say. Okay. <laughs> well, I've got a bit of a cough myself. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you, you told me that you're not sick. But everybody that you work with and everybody that you live with has the same symptoms. Yeah, a cough. It's the South. The weather keeps changing. I don't know what to tell you. Now i got a tickly throat and I don't know what to do about it. I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid to cough. You should probably drink some whiskey. <coughs> hey, look, uh, you're the first to cough on the podcast tonight. Yeah, only because uh, only because we reset. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's what all the people out there are going to believe. Though. Oh, is that right? So... Why don't you tell us what we're sipping on tonight? Because you told me and I don't remember. <laughs> um, we are drinking Town Branch. Okay. Whiskey. I mean, there's more to it than that, but I can't remember all the details. Yeah. Uh, this is a bottle that my um, my brother's family gave me for Christmas. And I think it's a distillery only bottle. Ooh. Single yeah. barrel. They did give you a distillery only bottle. Like that much I know. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so if they only gave you one bottle, this is that bottle. Yeah, it's a single barrel. I know that. Yeah. Um, and uh I I think like I liked it when I opened it, but I had it um a week or so ago again. Yeah. Before I went on a um a, on a scoff law kick. Yeah. And uh and it tasted so much better to me. I, really? I guess it, yeah. I mean, because bottles will do that, right? Like after they've been open, they get a little bit of air. They open up a little bit sometimes. Yeah. Um, and you get more complexity in the flavor. Yeah. And uh, and that's what happened here. And the thing that really stood out to me um, was this like kind of dark cherry flavor, which I was enjoying. I didn't really notice until you mentioned it. I feel like I can taste it now, but I also feel like that yeah, may power be, of suggestion. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can make you taste whatever I want. <laughs> but I'll say this: I like it. Like, and I I liked it before you mentioned the black cherry. Mm-hmm. So um, it's got a it's got a good flavor to it. I don't know. Yeah, the sweet's not really the word, but it's I don't know. It's good. I like it. Yeah, um, but then uh, GI Greg kept saying that um, Scofflaw was my favorite. Uh, favorite cocktail, which it's not. I yeah. I disagree with that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Even though you've made them all week. But well, I opened a bottle of dry vermouth, and it only lasts for about a month. So I mm. I gotta get as much use out of it as I can. So I made yeah. martinis, and then I started making scotch. <coughs> yeah. There you go. And um, and yeah, it may not be my favorite cocktail, but it is a really good one. <laughs> but you do like it. I do like it. Yeah. Uh, and I added, um, I bought these uh, bourbon infused cherries, actually, like right about Christmas time, um, that I found in a little uh, party supply store that I went in with my sister in law. Yeah. And um, usually you don't put a cherry in the in the scofflaw. It's yeah. just like a lemon twist, and that's your that's your garnish. Yeah. Um, but I've been doing a lemon twist and the little bourbon infused cherry and. And it works. Yeah. I don't know that it actually adds anything to it, but it is really tasty to have that little cherry at the end. <laughs> I was going to say that nice little dessert at the end. Yeah. 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 You give me a snack at the end of my cocktail. And then, uh, yeah. I'm going you know. to come back every time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I've been, I've been digging that. Yeah. Um, but I didn't feel like, you know, I didn't feel like doing that for the both of us tonight. So, <laughs> so it's whiskey in a glass. It so is. whiskey in a glass. Which I'm always perfectly happy with. I have no complaints. <laughs> uh, and I needed it after um, wading through the Neil deGrasse Tyson interview so that I could pull clips. I'm going to tell you way to take one for the team on that one. Like I've heard, oh, bit, I've heard bits and pieces of it. I haven't obviously I haven't listened to the whole thing because I don't know that I could stomach it. It was difficult. <laughs> I I uh, I listened to it. Well, I didn't listen to the entire interview. The entire interview is about an hour. Yeah. Um. I. Uh. I actually kept skipping ahead until I found where they were talking about COVID. Well, okay. So it wasn't really the COVID part that I wanted to pull because enough people have broken down the um the, the COVID and vaccine that stuff is coming out. Yeah, yeah. It's so. 
for somebody that's like so irritating, a legit scientist, like it's just blows my mind how they can get something so wrong, something that that they should get right because they're, I mean, because he talks about analyzing the data and following the numbers. Yeah, and except that the he doesn't do that. <laughs> like well, he doesn't, yeah, I mean, the statistics that he recites on the podcast are wrong. Yeah. Um. But the, I think the main thing about that is, you know, while I was, um, I'm looking at the, the vaccine data. How? Because they haven't released it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like when the, when the trials were through and they started pushing this vaccine, we didn't have trial data. Mm-mm. No. And we still don't have some of it, I think, or at least it hasn't all been combed through because yeah. they, they did a huge data dump or whatever. They were trying not to show it for however long. Yeah. 75 years Yeah, there or was some kind of, was it wasn't Freedom of Information, but there was some lawsuit mm-hmm. that forced them to release it, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember now. Yeah, I, but, I'm pretty sure we talked about it at the time on the podcast. Too, we so did, like, uh, but yeah, <laughs> go back and find it yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the information's out there now, but it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he's, I mean, he's talking about <laughs> things like um, you, you gotta like really turn away. My bad. Um, Sorry. He uh, he's talking about things like uh, well, you know, and if you get COVID, you got a three percent chance of dying uh, in the hospital. Is what he says. You got a three percent chance of dying in the hospital. The only way that I can figure that that might be close to an accurate statistic is he's saying that if you get COVID and you're admitted to the hospital, then you have a 3% chance of of dying. But, you know, at one point he says a 3% chance of dying, depending on what demographic you're in. I was like, I don't think that there is a demographic that had a 3% chance. Not, I mean, not that I can recall. I mean, you may have had a 3% chance if they put a G on a ventilator because a lot of people died on ventilators. Yeah, when they had the protocols wrong. Yeah, I mean, when they were like, di- or yeah, I guess the protocols is what I'm thinking mm-hmm. of. Yeah, when they were putting people on ventilators and it was killing them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and yeah, so I don't know. But that but that's not really the part that I want to that I want to address, because what he what he keeps doing to justify his position that he can't give up um, the at like it's like the height of narcissism, it seems to me, to be so certain that you're you're still justifying your mistake after the fact with faulty statistics and then invoking things like the social contract. Yeah, I guess I didn't turn off the air before we came in. I hope y'all can't hear that. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, there's a lot to say. There's a lot to be said about the social con the the quote unquote social contract. Yeah. Um, personally, and I think I've made this clear on the podcast before. I don't believe in the social contract. I don't what? think it exists. Yes. There is no <laughs> there is no social contract. But some of the stuff that he says with the social contract is just kind of unconscionable, I think, and like so flawed that I don't know where to begin. But before we get into the social contract stuff, I do also want to address like another th- another thing that I think is at play here as to why he is so strongly supporting I would say the government position on all of this yeah, is that his income is dependent on government. Yep. Um, he is the director of the Hayden planetarium in New York. Uh, it's attached to the Rose center for earth and space, which is part of the American museum of natural history in New York city. It falls under the authority of the New York state education department's board of regents. Hmm. His income comes from the government. Yeah. <laughs> And even more than his income, when he gets ready, to, he wants to do research or maybe they need a new telescope. Yeah, when he's looking for grants and stuff like that. Guess where he's going. Yeah. Um, and this is a problem in a, in a lot of areas of science at this point. Yeah. Uh, Climate change is one of them. I know that's yeah, what you're I, thinking. I, it is what I'm thinking, but I don't want to go down that path. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but um, that is a, that is an issue when you get a lot of these studies and stuff. Like, There's a reason they all seem to come to the same conclusion. Yeah, you definitely... I, I mean, I remember listening to a, um, a scientist talk about uh, going for grants and saying the most effective way of getting a grant right now is to work climate change into your grant proposal. Yeah. That you get money if you're researching the terrible effects of climate change in, you know, 
ground squirrels in the Central Park in New York or whatever. Like, yeah, <laughs> like they're, yeah, they're, just, they're, they're, that stuff's getting money right now. Yeah. Like, so he's dependent on the government for for his income, for job security, etc. <laughs> and I, I think that that's a huge part of of why he is so married to this position. Um, and it's, it was so hard listening to this also because I used to have a level of respect for Neil deGrasse Tyson. Now he was never, um, the Carl Sagan that he wanted to be. <laughs> that he, yeah. He would like to be. Yeah. Uh... Um, he, he has neither the intellect nor the charisma of a Carl Sagan. Yeah. And Carl Sagan isn't even actually a particularly charismatic person, I don't think, but he's he's influential because he's so measured in how he presents information and it's it's so solidly backed. And I I absolutely I totally I am a fanboy of Carl Sagan. I've read almost all of the books that he puts out. Yeah. Interviews, uh TV shows, like all of that stuff that he did. Um he's he he's really fantastic, and Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of set himself up to be the new Carl Sagan. Yeah, those are the shoes he wanted to fill. Yeah. yeah, and I appreciate the science communication, like trying to make science available for the layperson and so forth. But he's just not he's just not the caliber of scientist. Yeah, or or intellect yeah. that Carl Sagan was. Yeah. Um, and and speaking of, like, I really, I really wonder what. Carl Sagan would be saying about the last three years if he were here. Yeah. Now, um, I think that he would probably be closer to our position than he is to Neil deGrasse Tyson's. Yeah, I would um, have to agree just because the the data is on our side. Yeah, and Carl Sagan was like the king of skepticism. He has a whole book about skepticism, which I highly recommend to anybody. It's called The Demon Haunted World. Yeah. Uh, and it's you know he kind of describes it as a toolbox for um, sussing out BS. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's just a fun read anyway, yeah. but, um, is that it, the one with the invisible dragon? Yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. I, sometimes it's too long probably to just to recite tonight. the whole thing yeah. on the podcast and I'd have to go out and find it again anyway. To do it justice. Um, yeah. But it, it, he does have this story in there about the invisible dragon in somebody's garage. And so he just starts asking questions of the guy of how he could test to see if there's a dragon there and yeah. everything that he asks, the guy has an excuse as to why that won't work. Yeah. And essentially his conclusion is what's the difference between um, a dragon that I have no way of verifying is there and no dragon at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but it is a great story cause it's, oh, like it's so, so entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, I think that, I, I think that Carl Sagan would, would be with us in this cause he, he was such a skeptical, he was very skeptical of the argument from authority. Yeah. Um, he always talked about science as a process of eliminating possibilities and so forth instead of being a collection of facts. Yeah. And, um, and he was, uh, he was skeptical of big government and corporate interference and so forth. I, I just, I don't think that. Don't think he would just fall in line. No. Yeah. No. I'd have to and maybe, <laughs> maybe that's because I like him so much and I would like to think that he wouldn't, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, but who knows? Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I have like good reasons to think that he wouldn't. Yeah. And I've spent too much time talking about Carl Sagan and not enough time about Talking <laughs> the modern day Carl Sagan, yeah, the as it the were, ersatz Carl Sagan. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I gotta go hang on a sec, I gotta make a note. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, w what I wanted to address, and this is not actually his talk about the, the vaccine and the virus, um, and the possibilities and and so forth, but his. The, like the main thing that he invokes as to why everybody needed and still needs yeah. actually. Yeah. Cause to he fall hasn't line, abandoned it yet. Yeah. To fall in line and get the vaccine. And, um, what he keeps talking about is the social contract. And so this is the first time he brings it up in this interview. And, uh, so we'll play this little clip for you. All right. Um, there's a public health contract that you have signed implicitly as a citizen of a country 
where in part we depend on each other for health, our wealth, our security, and the like. And that contract is, in the best scientific evidence available at the time, if you do not get vaccinated, you will put other people in this organization at risk, and that organization does not want to take that risk. So you do not have this job anymore if you decline it. So in, w with any public health decision, there has to be a consequence to you not participating in that social contract. Is it your job? In some cases it was. But no, we're not going to have the army bust into your home and force a needle into your shoulder. Why not? Why aren't we going to have the army come in and bust a needle into your shoulder? I mean, come on. If, if it's that important and we sign the contract that we're going to do it, why, why is there a line? Why not just do that? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things wrong with that. <laughs> so let's start there, is that he somehow draws a line between um, coercion by threatening your livelihood and, and physical coercion of actually, like, holding you down and sticking it in your arm. Yeah. I don't see a difference. I don't see a difference either, which is the reason I don't understand why we have to draw that line. <laughs> yeah. Um, he also conflates the idea of a social contract and an employment contract there. Yeah. Um, he talks about, you know, if this if this organization uh, doesn't, you know, wants you to get the vaccine in order to continue working, then you got to do that or you won't continue working. Well, OK, that's not a social contract. That's an actual contract, like yeah. a real contract that you signed when you when when you were employed by some company. And I would say that you have a really good um you know, case to make if there wasn't some uh, some clause in that contract saying that you would agree to health whatever, you know, the medical procedures that the company deemed necessary for the safety of its people and customers or something like that. Yeah. I think if you didn't agree to that at the beginning, they have no way of holding you to it partway through your employment. Absolutely. Um, but even more than that, that push wasn't coming from those. I mean, it was essentially coming from those companies, but only because the government was behind it. Yeah, because by default, assumed, it was coming from them. The yeah. government was using the private companies to enforce their will. Absolutely, because mm -hmm. as soon as the courts overturned that, these companies dropped that like a bad habit. Yeah. At least a lot of them did. Yeah, and I, I was also um, struck by this idea that we're all, inter you know, we're dependent on each other for health, wealth, and security. Well... I mean, I don't think that any of those things were helped either by the vaccine or by the lockdowns. Yeah. Like, I don't know that you could make a case that any of those things were improved for the whole of society by any of the responses to COVID. Yeah. I mean, especially the keeping the kids out of school. Like, I mean, we're learning, we're, we talked about this at the time, but society's kind of catching up now mm -hmm. with these kids all behind. And it's like, we know why, like, it's not even a secret. Like, they've yeah. been kept out of school. For... I mean, it, it, he, he, I think actually at one point, um, when he's dealing with the in interviewer, it's a, the PBD podcast, by the way, is where I got this. Okay. I'm not actually familiar with it. That's just where the interview took place. And so, yeah. um, but, and I thought that the interviewer did a fairly good job of like trying to to get him to answer questions that are perfectly legitimate questions yeah. uh, that he sidestepped and did all kinds of mental gymnastics to either answer in like a really disingenuous way or not answer at all yeah. <laughs> the way I saw it. But um, there's a point where he says, well, you're looking at it with hindsight now. I'm like, yeah, that's true. Now we actually have the data to, to show that I was right when I was looking at it with foresight. Yeah. And it's not like, I mean, we weren't unique here. There were no. plenty of people who, saw, I mean, we saw, saw the basic of things. I yeah. mean, it's like, I just, we, we started talking. I think we actually started talking about this at the end of 2019. We did. Like the possibility of what could be done with COVID if it came over from China. Like, oh, there's this nasty oh, yeah. virus that's going around China. Yeah. Um, that, you know, what happens if it comes here, how will our government take advantage of the situation to gain more power? Yeah. Um, we had that interview with, uh, 
um, Michael Meharry in, I think it was in February of 2020. And that was like one of the big topics that we discussed during that time. And yeah. it was not on the map yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like COVID was not really a thing that was in the American consciousness at that time. Oh yeah. Um, so we started talking about this really early. And I, I think that both with foresight and now with hindsight, we were talking about the, um, the bad effects on health of the government response. Um, that, you know, people were going to be, uh, missing regular screenings that, uh, you know, I, I remember on the podcast talking really early after, um, lockdowns were instituted all over the place about increases in alcoholism and domestic violence and suicides in drug overdoses. Yep. Um, so I think that, and now that some of the, uh, excess death data is coming out, um, for the last year when, after vaccines had been, um, widespread yeah. and that they're so much higher than expected. Uh, I think that we're, you know, I don't, don't want to be like I told you so on this cause I sure as hell wish I had been wrong, yeah. but, um, you know, I think that those predictions are, are being borne out by the data now that it had, yeah. that the government response to this had a far, um, far worse negative health effect than the virus did. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then in terms of wealth, I don't yeah. like who's going to argue with me there that wealth was bled out um, by the the government response to COVID with the lockdowns and the eliminating jobs and the yeah. uh, the huge printing of money and sending money out to everybody. And well, that's what I was going to say. And if you don't believe that we've lost wealth in this country, go try to buy a carton of eggs. Yeah, because I'm telling you right now, that ain't no act. I mean, it's 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 a result of something we did. Yeah. you know, I mean, um, it's not that's not just like a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Um, security, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, a reduction in, uh, or a lowering of general health and, uh, wealth has a, a negative impact on security generally. Yeah. I don't know how to separate that, um, <laughs> specifically from, you know, like my feelings about the Ukraine war and stuff like that. But, yeah. um, but I don't think that we're in a better security position because of the reaction to COVID. That's, oh, absolutely that's certainly not, yeah. not true. So, um, like uh, his entire case there is just is just false. And then of course there's the idea that by being a citizen of a country that you have implicitly signed some agreement to do particular things whether you agree with them or not. Well, if I didn't agree with them, I wouldn't have ag agreed. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know like a, a, a well, contract you don't have a choice. You have to agree. Uh, yeah, a contract is explicit. Like you are agreeing to terms. If like the terms are made up halfway through or I mean, what I find when people argue for the social contract is generally speaking, they're using the social social contract as a justification of coercing you into doing what they want. Yeah. Well, and this just occurred to me right now. I mean, if you really do think about it, we kind of do have a social contract. It's not really called that, though. Mm -hmm. It's called the Constitution. Well, that's, uh, yeah. But I we mean, don't even follow it, though, is my point where I'm going. Yeah. Like, we have that. And, I mean, if you want to say we have a social contract, I mean, I would give you the Constitution. I would be like, okay, mm -hmm. that's our social contract. Yeah. Well, that is actually an explicit contract. I mean, they call yeah. it a, a compact, which is a, a, a contract between states. Yeah. Yeah. Still, though, it's, but we don't even follow it. Like yeah. it's, it's well, the the social contract as it's used, though, is this implicit idea that you have agreed to certain terms yeah. um, within the society just by virtue of you being here. Yeah. And that you have you have agreed to this yeah. somehow yeah. Um, from birth. That's 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 the first and thing you do after to, you come out. Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you've agreed to it, uh, you know, regardless of how it changes or how it's how it's used for or against you. Yeah. Um, and that by virtue of not having left, yeah. you, you are continuing to agree. Yeah. Now, first off, nobody can ever show me where this contract is. Yeah. I mean, you came the closest just then, but that's not what yeah, they're no, talking about. And, and I know it's not, I'm just saying it, it occurred to me while we were talking, I was like, I mean, that is at least something. Though. Yeah. Any kind of an agreement between people that can be referred to as a contract contract has to have explicit terms. Yeah. And I That's the see, whole point of having a contract. I want to see where my signature's at. Yeah. Because I think it was forged. Um, and something that I always bring up with people, and this isn't even the most like brutal or extreme example that I can come up with, but it's one that, that generally um, resonates, 
is that, you know, by this argument, a woman living in Saudi Arabia has agreed to be an oppressed party. Yeah. That's their social I mean, they, contract. They haven't left. That's the way the society works there. She was born into it. She hasn't left. So therefore she has agreed yeah. to be a second class citizen. Yeah. <laughs> Is anybody going to actually like make that argument? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't remember what the next clip is, but let's go ahead and play that. Well, let's play it and get it started. <laughs> because it's that. not about you. It's about people you interact with. And that's the social contract of public but we don't Have you noticed that somewhere in here, um, the idea of vaccines has shifted from uh, you need to protect yourself and get a vaccine to you need to get the vaccine to protect everybody else? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny how that works. Yeah. It's not about you. It's about others. Yeah. Well, well okay. that's that's what they say when they want to make that argument. Yeah. But the truth is, is that argument fell apart month after the vaccine started when everybody started getting sick with the vaccine. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it certainly falls apart when you um, show that the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting or spreading. Yeah. I mean, but he still makes the case through the whole thing. Well, it'll keep you from dying. Yeah, which uh, the, which is an <laughs> argument that you should get it for yourself, not for others. Right. That doesn't obligate somebody else. Yeah, you're you're protected now by getting the vaccine. You don't need yeah. me to you don't also. Need, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and you certainly don't have a right to force me, uh, yeah. which I think is the next clip. But we'll, we're not there yet. Right. Um, the the other point here is that this is this is an argument that can be used to justify all kinds of terrible things. Um, that I can coerce you if it's for the greater good, that yeah. I can do what I need. I mean, do you think that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson would agree that it is moral or um, ethical for me to kill him and harvest his organs? Because just with, through his one death, I can save 10 other people. Yeah, but he may look at it the other way. He may look at it for it's okay for him to kill you to save 10 other people. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> arguments the same, though. Yeah, right. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, he's older than me, so. Oh, okay. I don't know. He's not going to be fond of you if you listen to this podcast, so. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, I will forego my opportunity of shaking hands with Neil deGrasse Tyson on good terms. Oh, uh, fair enough. Just to address this uh, idiocy. Yeah. Idiocy is not the word that I want. Absurdity? Inanity? Anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can use that argument. Well, you know, it's for the greater good to justify all kinds of things, terrible things. And it has been used to justify all kinds of terrible things in the past. Yeah, throughout history, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, the idea of the greater good is just a, is just an excuse for evil acts. I mean, if, if, if coercion is used to obtain it, then yeah. it's just an excuse for evil acts. Yeah, I agree. If I voluntarily give up my organs to save 10 people... Yeah. That's a moral good. If yeah. somebody takes them from me against my will, it's not, even if 10 people are saved. <laughs> so that's where the line is. <laughs> I think so. It's uh, it's all about volunteerism. It's all right? about volunteerism. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and play the next clip. Let's do it. In a case where you can contaminate someone else, it's not about you. It's about the collective You're assuming. health. Isn't that always the case yeah. aren't you always in a position where you could potentially contaminate somebody else yeah it's called life yeah i mean and and we <laughs> talked about this at the very beginning of this is you you really do you have to choose how you're going to live your life i mean are you going to be a person that locks theirself in their room and hides from the world to over a virus or are you going to, or, but it, we, it was a virus in this instance, mm -hmm. but in reality it could be anything. Yeah. You know, I mean, even just pre pandemic, you know, if you're mm -hmm. afraid to get the flu, you're yeah. going to hide in your room. Every time you get on the road, you have a chance of, of killing somebody. Yeah. <laughs> like every time you do almost anything. In fact, that's, that's actually where he goes is Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks that yes, you should lock yourself in your room. Let's yeah. hear that. All right. Should the individual not have the right to say, I don't want to take it because that's... You don't have the right to contaminate someone else. So if you don't want to get who shot... Who says that, though? But who says that? It's a, it's a, it's a social contract in a modern civilization I don't have for the, public health. I don't have the right to contaminate someone else. In What do you mean? Like, so what do I do? Stay it's, home it's, all day? Yeah, or, or it's go to the beach, yeah. You stay you stay away from other old people who... You know, but you stay away but, from people but, who are, but, who are but, immune compromised? But, for how long? In what instance? 
Like, what are the the prerequisites for me having to stay home? Well, I think that the people who are immune compromised need to take responsibility and stay away from me. Like, I mean, because that's that was what he was making. That was the argument he was making at the end. You mm-hmm. don't have a right to to contaminate somebody who has who's immune compromised. And hey, I got sympathy for that person, but I need to know not to come near you. Like, it, I can't just, I can't hide from you and while you walk the streets, like, that's not fair. Like, that's mm-hmm. not the world I want to live in. Yeah. Do you remember all the stories during the lockdowns of, um, like, grandparents and so forth in nursing homes where they hadn't seen anybody in their family in, who knows, in months yeah. and whatever, yeah. and how they were pleading for the opportunity to potentially be infected yeah. so that they could see their grandkids or their kids yeah. and so forth again? It's not his choice. Exactly. That, that's really what this comes down to is that the, you know, the social contract is used to justify um, a coercion of somebody else to follow the path that you want them to follow. Yeah. But that's not your place yeah. to decide. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and that's the problem with the whole concept. Actually, uh, one of the first articles that I wrote on the website, on our website, yeah. So if you go way back to the beginning of the posts, yeah. um, you'll find a, an article on the social contract where it's just like a series of questions. I don't, yeah. I, I don't actually, I'm not actually like making an argument in it. No. I'm just saying like, if you believe in this, like you have to resolve these X, Y, and Z. Yeah. yeah. This set of questions like, and, uh, I th- I think it still stands up. I haven't read it in a while. I'm I'm I've certainly read more <laughs> since then. That was four years ago. When did we start this podcast? Five years ago. I don't know. Yeah, it was a long it's time. been a while. Yeah. Um, and uh, but the I think that the the social contract is a myth. That's really the point here. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I'm really frustrated by somebody who is an astronomer by trade. Yeah. Um, foraying into um philosophy of government or social uh social philosophy and and being so bad at it well yeah that too but um and using this concept to try and justify what he thinks should have been done yeah and i don't even know it's hard for me to believe that he even actually thinks that this should have been done at this point he's just trying to justify where he was yeah and like the statements that he was making all the time although he he's so uh, flagrant through this interview yelling and gesticulating and so forth that maybe i mean you know <laughs> he like i up. said he's not the intellect of carl sagan yeah oh, that's obvious if you listen to this interview yeah I tell you and that. I, I lost i like i said i did respect <laughs> the guy um i used to listen to his podcast uh years ago um it was like pretty good science content stuff that I wouldn't have heard about otherwise probably. Although at that time I was like a regular reader of silence daily too. Um, I don't get into that, that website as much as I used to now, but, um, you know, like I was keeping up with a lot of stuff, but his, his podcast was interesting. I had good interviews with people, uh, about various, um, contemporary topics, mostly in cosmology, astronomy, um, planetary physics and stuff like that. His field. Yeah. Yeah. Not all of it was though. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I found it really interesting and I'm glad that he was doing that stuff. And I guess I probably still should be because I, I wish more people were science literate, but listening to him here, I think, well, maybe this isn't the guy you need to go to though. Right. <laughs> and, uh, I, I lost, uh, well, I lost all respect for him actually. Like yeah. I, I, you know, he, he's not, um, I don't know. He's not getting any more of my time. Really. He's he's not a uh, to me. He's he's not an honest broker. Yeah. Like I, I I would have trouble listening to anything he said now and and like trusting it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. Okay. So I know that you used to regularly follow uh, Michio Kaku. I did. He's uh, another like good science communicator, a guy that I had had a lot of respect for. Do you know what he's been saying? I haven't heard anything from him I haven't, in a long so time. So I follow like, him, so. but he, he hasn't had any post in a while now, at least that I have showed up in my feed. Yeah. Um. So I need to go to his site and check him out. And 
Just yeah. see if he's posting anything or kind of where he stands on some of this. Yeah. Well, um, I think that he works for the City University in New York, so he may be just keeping his mouth shut to stay out of trouble. It kind of sounds that way because, like I said, I haven't seen the post from him in a long time. Because I, so. I, I feel confident that if Michio Kaku was out there saying, um, you know, everybody should take the vaccine, the data says that the vaccine's good for you, et cetera, yeah. that they would be plastering that, that all over the place. Yeah. Um. And I, I imagine that he would be getting a real um, pushback if he was saying the opposite, and that I would have heard that too. Yeah. So I'm guessing that he's just saying nothing. It, and I imagine that if he's saying nothing, he's saying nothing because he knows Because better. he's looked at the data and doesn't want to lose all of his grant money. Yeah, or or his credibility. Yeah, well, that too, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you got both sides to play. Like yep. you, you don't want to upset the government because you want to keep your your income, yeah. and you don't want to upset the people that you're dependent on as a science communicator to trust you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. that's interesting. Um. Okay. Well, with that, do you have anything more on that? We spent like no. way more time on that than I thought we would. Honestly. I mean, I don't. I mean, it's it's just it it's very frustrating listening to him though. Mm -hmm. Um. Somebody that I've, I mean, I've never had a problem with him. Like I've always trusted him at his word on stuff. But yeah. like I was saying before, like I could never now. Like I mean, even if he came out with something that I agreed with, mm -hmm. I'd question it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've had some issues with him on topics. Climate change is one of them, actually. Like he's yeah. out. The, he's one of the ninety-eight percent or ninety-seven percent of scientists agree. Yeah. But that's not his field. Yeah. And it and it's clear when he starts talking about it. Is it? I yeah. say is obviously not a climate. You're, you're myself, no climatologist but, yourself. Oh, yeah. But, um, but it, it, you know, listening to him and comparing him to uh, climate scientists that are on the other side yeah, um, that are talking about it, it, it's clear that he, you know, he's just dependent on the mainstream data and not really questioning yeah. w what's going on. So, uh, I mean, I've had some issues with him on, on topics in the past that I disagreed with, and I don't think that he made a strong argument for why he's right. Yeah. Um, but this, generally this was embarrassing. Though. Yeah, this was embarrassing. I, like yeah. generally I had respect for him until now and this was just yeah. embarrassing. Yeah. And I, I recommend people that if you haven't heard it, that you go out and listen to some people just like, I mean, whoever it is that you like, whatever side that you're on, uh, you know, side of the political aisle you're on, I promise you, you can find somebody taking down his scientific arguments on this too. Yeah. And you should listen to that because yeah. Well, I actually I hate to put you through that. It's it's hard to listen to, but it's it's time well spent. But I yeah, I listened to it. And so you should all suffer with me. All right, there you go. Um but uh Jimmy Dore did a thing on this. Uh Dave Smith, of course, did a thing on this. Yeah. Um I saw at least one other that's like more on the right. Um <laughs> oh, I can't remember. Oh well, doesn't matter. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sure you can find They're them. out there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to shift to Ukraine and kind of pick up what we were talking about last podcast and some things that I didn't, um, that I didn't mention that I think are important. And, uh, so, but I, I wanted to start with what we said, what I said before about Merkel's comment, um, about Minsk to, uh, that's former PM or whatever her job title was in Germany, Yeah, For, former leader of Germany. Angela Merkel, um, saying that the Minsk II agreement that they helped broker between Russia and Ukraine to protect the Russian ethnic groups in the east and south of Ukraine, um, that that was just a, a delay tactic. Now, yeah. I don't actually believe that that was true. I don't think that they were foresighted enough. Um, I think that she's just trying to uh, appease like war hawks in Germany at this point, or I'm not sure. Anyway... Yeah. Uh, but she did, you know, of course, make the statement that the Minsk II agree that they never had any intention of following the Minsk II agreement or enforcing the Minsk II agreement. They were just using it to delay Russia while they armed Ukraine and got them ready for the war. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I've been trying to think about this whole thing from the Russian perspective. Now, obviously, their rea reaction to that was just that, well we can't trust anything these guys from the West say to us. Like any agreement that they make is just an underhanded tactic to try and take it, take us down in the long run. They don't have any intentions of honoring any agreements that they enter. Yeah. Um, and of course the, the, the funny thing is that <laughs> that's exactly the, uh, the point that the Western powers are making about Russia. 
Well, yeah. Russia won't honor any agreement that they enter. <laughs> we can't trust Russia to honor any agreement, but it always seems to be the West that breaks the agreement. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway. Going back to the 90s and, and the beginning of this, like yeah. from the very beginning, we're the ones breaking the agreements. Yes. Um, so, but I've, I've been trying to think about this from the Russian perspective and and I think I'm actually coming down on the idea that they had to invade Ukraine now. Yeah. Uh, because I think from the Russian perspective that they were looking at this and of course, you know, NATO had, or at least the U S but NATO, um, or the West collectively yeah. had already started shipping weapons into Ukraine before the war. Um, they were, uh, training Ukrainian soldiers they were starting to integrate Ukraine into like NATO's uh, communication stuff and so forth. Um, and I think from the Russian perspective, like, okay, well, first off for eight years, the Ukrainian um, military was attacking Russian ethnic groups in the, the East and South of the country. Yeah. Like that was happening. Yeah. Um, they, they had already had an internal war, a civil war against the, the Russian ethnic, um, civilian population in Ukraine. And there was pressure, political pressure in Russia to do something about that. Yeah. So you already have that. But even if you ignore, ignore the antecedent, pretend that none of that happened still from the Russian perspective, you have to think that, that they had to start thinking, we need to solve the problem of Ukraine while it's still a smaller problem. Yeah. Before Ukraine is, is fully trained and stocked with NATO equipment, um, before Ukraine is fully integrated with NATO intelligence and uh, communications. Um, like, Well, and something else to kind of think about here. Um, didn't we like basically go in and flip one of their elections in Ukraine? Well, or no, was the revolution? Yeah, it was the the Maidan coup in 2014. Okay. Um, after an election, the U.S. was involved in um, the revolution to overthrow the Russian leaning government and replace them. That was the whole uh, yeah. F the EU tape. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I'm thinking of. But yeah. but I mean, like, we'd done it in 2004, also the Orange Revolution in 2004. So this yeah. is actually the second second time. time. So I mean, and Russia's got to be looking at that as like this isn't going to get any better. Yeah. Well, and we essentially told them like, so how do you respond as a Russian? Yeah. How do you respond when the U.S. slash NATO says we're building an enemy for you? On your border. Yeah. Do you just wait until they're done? That they're ready? Like, Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I want everybody to kind of step back a minute because just think if that was happening on our border. Right. Like, I mean, what if the Russians were... Think of how up in arms people are about uh, China um, shipping drugs through Mexico. Yeah. And how that's an act of war against, uh, against the U.S. Yeah, exactly. And the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, like mm -hmm. all of these things, like, I mean, we would not tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And you expect Russia to? Yeah. Yeah. When we essentially told them, like, we, yeah. we are training this country to fight you. Yeah. Yeah. On your border. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I know the one of the core tenets of libertarianism is that uh, we do not um, use force or coercion against peaceful people. Absolutely. Now, you would find a large section of libertarians that would say that um, that threatening is an act of aggression. Yeah. And therefore justifies an aggressive response. Probably looking at one of them. Well, I suspect so. <laughs> I mean, if somebody's standing over you telling, you know, bowed up, with their fists raised and telling you they're, they're going to beat your ass. Do you wait until he hits you before you do anything about it? I don't, I, I don't tell you right now. I don't <laughs> No, It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Like that person is already aggressing against you. You are, yeah. uh, you don't have to wait for the first fire to fight, you know, yeah. fly, fly, whatever. Like, right. You know, first fist to fly. Yeah. There you go. You know, you want to be the first fist to fly. Exactly. Like, um, because, and, and so that's the position that we put Russia in. And the longer they waited, the more 
trouble it was going to cause them. Yeah. And um, <laughs> you'll also... Uh, so the other part of this, and this I don't think I mentioned this on the last podcast, but this is really important um, as we talk about the possibility of nuclear escalation and so forth. Now, the the West's certainty that Russia will not escalate to nuclear is based on um, that they haven't yet. Yeah. As okay. Th- as the West has escalated and, you know, <laughs> sent more into Ukraine and helped Ukraine more and encouraged Ukraine to do more, Russia hasn't responded by escalating to nuclear. So therefore they won't is essentially the idea that we can continue to escalate without them responding. Now, the the problem with that is that Russia has escalated in response. Yeah. There were no attacks on civilian infrastructure in Ukraine um, until the uh, the bridge explosion in Crimea, the uh, Kerch Bridge explosion. Yeah. So when Ukraine all but openly claimed responsibility for sabotaging the bridge, uh, that's when Russia started um, attacking their uh, energy infrastructure. Yeah. It was after that. Yeah. So Russia has escalated in response to escalations. Yeah. Um, You also have to remember that before the war, the U.S. was talking about that they were carefully calculating um, the level of arms shipments and so forth they could send into Ukraine that wouldn't trigger a military response from Russia. Yeah. All right. And they're still trying to do the same thing. They're trying to see how... Calculate how, how, how far, far can they we can, push this? Yeah, before yeah. without without getting Russia to respond in a serious escalatory manner. Yeah. Well, they failed on the calculation, obviously, of how much they could send into Ukraine bef- without Russia responding militarily. Yeah. So, are we trusting them to be able to figure that out again this time with a, a you know with a nuclear response in the balance? Yeah. And now. Um, the and actually before our last podcast, uh, the U.S. was already talking about giving Ukraine the the go ahead to attack Crimea. Yeah, which Russia absolutely considers its own sovereign territory. Yeah, of course we'd already encouraged them to attack the bases inside of Russia, um, but you know now Crimea as well, and um, and now, like as of yesterday, I think. Um, we're planning to ship uh, tanks, like yep. Abrams, M1 Abrams, a battalion of M1 Abrams in there um, with Germany, also sending in Leopard 2 tanks. And Well, and it's worth mentioning here that that Germany was standoffish about sending these tanks. Like, this mm-hmm. is probably, what, maybe not quite a week, but close to a week of, like, basically them trying to get this through their whatever parliamentary system they use. Mm-hmm. Um to get authorization because the the people of Germany, I saw some like man on the street interviews today. People are nervous about this. Yeah, and they should be. They and should Russia be. has already responded uh, like in talks anyway, yeah. um, saying that if uh, if German tanks are used in Ukraine, yeah. that um, that Russia considers German military infrastructure in Germany legitimate targets. Yeah. Well, and. I mean, there's there's definitely I, so I I think I heard today w- that they had decided to actually send these tanks in, mm-hmm. um, and like I didn't like it. Like I was I was I knew that it was going to eventually happen. Like the U.S. was pushing so hard for them to do this that I knew it was coming one way or the other. But it's not good. Yeah, like no good comes from this. Yeah, and Biden agreed to send uh, American M1 Abrams tanks in. Um, against the Pentagon. Like the oh, Pentagon really? was saying no. Yeah. And and Biden said, "Well, I'm I'm the commander in chief." Yeah. Because we need to do this in order for Germany to send in tanks. Because Germany finally said, "Look, you know, you're going to have to put some skin in too if we're doing this." Yeah. So we're not sending our tanks unless you're sending your tanks. Yeah. And then we agreed to. And it wasn't it wasn't really that long ago that Biden was saying that we would only provide defensive military equipment to Ukraine. Yeah. And then we started sending in the the high Mars and, and harms and all these, you know, all this rockets and artillery. Yeah. Um, and then we started telling them that they could use it to attack <laughs> targets in Russia 
And now we're telling them that they can attack targets in Crimea. And now we're sending them tanks too. Yeah. So there's some real serious scope creep going on here. Well, that and I mean, we're all, the the knobs only a few clicks away from boots on the ground. Yeah. I mean, we're not we're not that far away here. Well, and the really sad part though is that um, those tanks won't get very far. Yeah. I, I would be surprised if any of those tanks hit the front lines. Really? Because I think that as soon as they get them inside of Ukraine with Ukrainian crews. Yeah. They're going to be destroyed. Well, part of the reason that I'm assuming it was the Pentagon was pushing not to send the Abrams in is because they don't think the Ukrainians can maintain them. Um, apparently, they use some kind of jet engine that takes jet fuel, and they just don't think that they can be maintained by the Ukrainians. And they're probably right. Yeah. I mean, that's um, the reason. That's I, I would imagine, at least, that's the reason we were pushing Germany to send theirs so much is yeah. because they're probably easier for the Ukrainians to maintain than ours. Yeah. Um, retired Colonel Douglas McGregor was saying that these tanks are um, are a real problem to maintain. Really? And, have, and, and are for the U.S. military. Yeah, for us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because these planes were, I mean, these uh, engines were designed for planes being, you know, 15,000 feet up in the air. Yeah. Um, where you don't have dirt and grime and dust and like all these things that get into the intakes and so forth and clog stuff up. Yeah. Oh, I can see that. I mean, I, I don't know. I have very little, but some experience with engines. I just can't imagine a jet engine is easy to maintain. Like, no, probably not. Just saying. And they're, they're already having issues with supply lines. Um, there's already been some movement uh, by Russia. They, they're they kind of closing in and doing some maneuvers around some of these areas um, where the lines are anyway. They've made some advancements. And they, you know, as far as most people say, they aren't really doing an assault yet. They're just kind of putting, making sure that they have people in positions in the right places. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, we'll, <coughs> we'll see what happens, but unfortunately, yeah. Um, but this isn't good for the people of Ukraine, no matter what. Yeah. This is just prolonging an, an inevitable end. Well, and it, it's funny you mentioned that specifically too, because I think we talked about this on the last podcast, but when they were doing the man on the street with the people of Germany, mm -hmm. of course, a lot of them were like upset because they were worried about retaliation from the mm -hmm. Russians. But a lot of the people um, were just upset because they were like that. They would they were like the the argument they would propose was, well, we'd like to help the people of Ukraine, but the people of Ukraine, yeah. not not the military of Ukraine. Well, like, you did um, see those reports that they uh, that a whole bunch of people um, higher up in government in Ukraine have had to resign because they were taking money from all these international aid packages that were going in, like all this corruption oh, stuff. Yeah, that which is no surprise. Yeah, but, that shouldn't surprise um, anyone. But yeah, it. So this has all happened just just recently. And um, oh gosh, what was the other thing? There was another like big piece of news about that. Now I can't remember what it was. Um, because I wasn't prepared to talk about it and I don't have any notes. And, you know. um, <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, that's, that's the point though, is that even the people of Germany wouldn't be opposed to helping the people of Ukraine, mm -hmm. but they don't seem to be too up at, about supporting their military. Yeah. Well, and, and it's unfortunate too, that if this happens the way it might, um, then if Russia ends up attacking military targets in Germany yeah. as, as a result of this, then it'll confirm the tired old narrative about how Russia's just going to try and march across Europe and rebuild the, the Soviet empire. Yeah. Uh, and that well, they have no intention of that, but, but the, the reaction, but they of the could West, be forced into a scenario where it looks that way. Yeah. Um, that's what I was going to say is that the, the reaction or the actions of the West, the collective West here are kind of putting Russia in a position where they have no choice, but to take all of Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. At, which they are capable of doing whether you think so or not. Yeah. Um, without actual, um, barring, barring the U S or one of these other big yeah. countries, NATO, jumping in. NATO actually NATO, getting involved. Yeah. yeah. Well, NATO getting involved would be the, um, play. 
And the the other unfortunate aspect of this, and I, this is what I was trying to come up with a minute ago, is that this is an existential issue for Russia, th- yeah. this war on their border. Um, it wouldn't be for the United States as an example. Yeah. But the administration has made it one. Yeah. So the, and mostly because of economic stuff, because yeah. what the, the U S uh, by imposing all these sanctions and forcing everybody on our side to also impose all these sanctions and causing these terrible economic ripples throughout the world. Uh, one of the results is that the other three quarters of the world that's not on board with all of this is kind of forming their own little economic coalition with Russia and China as the leads. Yeah. And so at this point, the U S has sacrificed (laughs) its economic hegemony over the world about this war and, or for this war, or I I don't know how to term it exactly, but, um, but the state of, of, uh, maintaining the U S's economic hegemony over the world is tied into the outcome of this war at this point. So now it's kind of an existential issue for the U S as well, because backing out or losing results in, um, a loss of that, that unipolar world that they're, that the U S government has been trying to maintain all this time. Yeah. Well, we've done that to ourselves, And so now you have both sides where it's an existential issue. Yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't end well. Mm -mm. No. And and so that's my real concern. It's never made logical sense to me. Why would we, why would we want to force those groups together anyway? Like, why would we push the Russians and Chinese closer together? It, you would think that what we would want to do is separate them as much as possible because them together is not a good mix. Well, it's because the people advocating for these policies don't care about people. Yeah. And they don't care about the nations really either. Yeah. Um, and, and they're probably arrogant enough to think that we could beat it all anyway. Yeah. And... Maybe we could, but at what cost? Cost of the whole, like, you know. I mean, potentially the, the globe. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. so, I mean, who really wins that war? Nobody. So. Nobody wins. Yeah. I mean, and that's where we are. We're in a no-win situation now. And it could have been avoided. And I don't think that, like I was saying on the last podcast, I'm just not sure that that anybody in place to make a decision um is, uh, I don't know, confident or strong enough to just call it quits. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this much for, for sure is nobody in this administration that's currently in office Mm -hmm. is capable of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the best thing we can hope for is we <laughs> remember that vote libertarian in twenty twenty four. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, they'll they'll follow through. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, I suspect that of the candidates that are available in twenty twenty four, um, there's not going to be a Republican or Democrat candidate uh, in Willing. the general election. Yeah. Um, that would end this. No. So you, the only way it's going to happen is to vote for a third party. No. And I'll be honest. I don't know that we'll have anybody campaign to end it. As far I, Oh, not, I'm sure that we will. Well, not, I'm uh, sure that I they... Mean, oh. I, mean, I mean in the Republican or Democrat. I know. No. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm sure that, that they will. So? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure that there will pe- be people in the primary season that will be campaigning well, against it. And okay. they will be taken down yeah. very quickly. You're right. I was I was meaning in the general, but yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. In the campaign in the in the primaries, you're right. There'll be there'll be some voices, but mm-hmm. they will be be squashed. Yeah. Um very, very quickly. It'll be like the Ron Paul days where yep. you uh you list the first, second, and fourth place finishers <laughs> and just pretend that he isn't there at all. Yep. He's, he's just not even there. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah. Yep. All right, so there's got to be a happy note to end that on. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Drawing a blank. <laughs> I mean, I, w- I wish... The problem I have is I just don't see a good way that this unwinds, and that's what I talked yeah. about on the last one. Like, mm-hmm. I just wish... I wish and that's what I'm trying to come up with right now is like a, a scenario where this kind of dissipates. Yeah. I still think that the best bet is that um, 
that it'll come to a diplomatic conclusion and the U.S. will call it a win by saying that, uh, you know, Russia only took half of Ukraine and they were going to take all of Europe if we hadn't stopped them in Ukraine. Yeah. That's the best bet. Yeah. And, and that would be, I mean, if, if that came to fruition, that would be what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. That's at this point, that's, that's what I'm hoping that's for. That's the best we got. <laughs> yeah. Um, because there's not, a, you know, at the end of the year, at the end of 2022, there was some real talk about pushing for some diplomacy to end this thing. Yeah. And that seems to have disappeared again. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't heard anything about that, but I hear a lot about tanks this week. Yep. Tank talk. Yeah. Um, we, we have to give the politicians the room to, to um, bring this to a peaceful conclusion and not look weak. Yeah, yeah. And both sides have to have that. Yes. Um, not just us. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, everybody has to be able to save face. Yeah. Um, and still put an end to this. Yeah. Quickly. Yeah. Before it goes more. I mean, the longer it goes, the, the, they moved the doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight, which is the closest it's ever been to midnight. Uh, really? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think this is kind of arbitrary, but the, yeah. the people in charge of, of running this thing. Also, I think it would have more impact if it hadn't always been less than five minutes to midnight. Oh, really? Like, yeah. You know, I don't know a whole a, lot about this thing. So. If there was a bigger movement, like it's, it's, you know, it's this clock, like a whole bunch of like scientists and nuclear physicists and which who are also scientists and probably some politicians and so forth or people <laughs> involved in government um, have the, the doomsday clock, which has always been, if it reaches midnight, that's, that's the nuclear end. Holocaust. Right. Okay. And, uh, does but, it have to be nuclear? I don't guess so, but that's how it's always been used. Okay. Okay. I, I didn't know if this was like a, if there was a climate change element. I don't think so. Okay. I don't, I don't actually know. The only a context I've ever heard it in is, is the nuclear. possibility of a nuclear exchange. Okay. And, but I think since its inception, it's, it's been like less Five than, less minutes. than three minutes to midnight. Oh, really? Like the entire time. Yeah. But at now they have it as a minute and a half till midnight and that's the closest it's ever been to midnight. Yeah. Does it ever go the other way? Oh yeah, they back it they up. They back it up. Okay, yeah, they back All it right. up. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so. And something else for me to monitor. And horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like I said, I think that they would have been they would have been better off if they had like moved it. You know, if they were using the whole twelve hours. Yeah. Instead of just the last few minutes, because I, I understand like the whole idea is to. Well, the collapse of the Soviet Union, like that, had to have been like a nice wind back. Right? Yeah, you would have thought. Yeah. But I think at that point they're saying, well, now who controls all these nuclear weapons that were in oh, the Soviet yeah. Union? You know. That's fair. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's a it's a way to, to keep pushing the fear. Yeah. Interesting. Fear is control, really, right? Absolutely. So, um, the it, it never gets very far from midnight because then people won't be properly scared. Yeah. Yeah. Fair <laughs> but enough. I think that I, I think that it would be more effective if they used. If, more if of the there clock. was a more yeah I yeah hear. i mean if if it had moved from um six o'clock to ten thirty yeah that feels like a, a jump to me <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah uh so i don't know if anybody that's involved in the uh, the doomsday clock project hears this like just think about it yeah all right. just, Cons about just it. consider a re, a yeah. re next time you get to wind it back maybe wind it back a lot yeah there you go we don't want to make people too comfortable, though. Right. <laughs> right. You can't go past six. I mean, that's just like, yeah. who cares? As long as as long as they <laughs> exist, the, the weapons exist, we got to be at least six, right? Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, that's fair, right? right. Um, all right. Well, we're over an hour. <laughs> like, actually, a fair bit, I think, once we put clips yeah, in. Yeah, with, with all the clips. Um, so, uh, yeah, we should go ahead and wrap it up. Wind this up. Ah, mm. nice. Uh, I'm so proud of myself for that one. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I love it. So um, let's see. Next week will be first week of February, right? Oh, yeah. And next week we got to go. We got to postpone the day. Yeah, but nobody ever knows yeah. that anyway. Like sometimes we're on Friday anyway. Yeah, but it'll be but Friday. But we know that it'll be we'll, Friday. It will be Friday next okay. week. Yeah. So, yeah, we know it'll be Friday next week. So, um It'll be just a little bit more than a week before you hear from us again. Yep. And uh, in the meantime, though, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and or Podbean. 
Um, like and share, uh, leave comments, um, criticisms, reviews, uh, tell your friends and all that other stuff. Absolutely. Because that all helps us and, um, and we really appreciate it. And uh, you can always email me at michael at thelibertymike.com. Oh, I actually had a question about something before the podcast. I should have written it down. I thought surely somebody in our audience would know what it was, but now I can't, now I can't remember what it was uh, that I wanted cool. to ask about. <laughs> oh, well. So if you, if you have like esoteric knowledge, you can just send that to me too. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> and, uh, but Michael at the Liberty Mike.com and we will be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.